With Halloween around the corner, you're about to learn the top 10 scariest mistakes players are making in arena. Including one related to ghost kicking? What the hell is that? Sounds spooky, but wait, there's more. Because later you will learn what the Bob Ross of bodybuilding can teach us about WoW Arena, which is a sentence no human being has ever said before until now. So if you don't want to end up in the next Joe Fernandez rage clip, stay tuned because we will teach you how to fix the most common problems in WoW Arena. Before we get into it, we want to take a moment to remind you of the 400 rating gain guarantee available only at scalecap.com. That's right, for as low as $6.99 a month, we guarantee that you'll see rating gains, and if you don't, then you'll get a full refund, no questions asked. With a subscription to Skillcap, you gain access to class guides that guide you step by step on how to deal rank 1 level damage, and how to survive and crowd control just like the pros you watch on Twitch. We also have a massive library of nearly 2,000 arena commentaries that teach you how to play your toughest matchups. And if that wasn't enough, Skillcap members also gain access to the premium section of our Discord server, where they gain direct contact to our network of pro players. This feature has helped players just like you reach their rating goals in recent months, so if you want to start seeing immediate results just like these ones, be sure to click on the discount link below right after this. For now though, let's get back to the video. To start, let's talk about interrupting, which is one of the most misunderstood mechanical skills in WoW. This results in the ones being good at it being labeled as bots and the ones who are bad at it dead on the floor. So what are the huge mistakes you're making with your kicks that are causing you to die prematurely? Well, first off, interrupting isn't just about trying to kick as fast as possible. It's not 2016 anymore, and the golden era of instant wazzing has passed since precognition has entered the chat. The average player thinks that being good at kicking means stopping casts quickly every time, but the best players think of interrupts as more than the kick itself. The true threat is having a kick available, forcing time from the enemy caster as they try and spam fake. This is ghost kicking, and it's insanely broken. If you hold your pummel, you can play a mental game with the enemy caster, forcing them to sweat it out with jukes. You've not only created more pressure, but prevented them from casting for longer than the actual kick itself. When you commit your kick, you also need a plan of action afterwards, especially if you're a melee. It's all well and good kicking one chaos bolt, but what happens after that? Did you have a stun for the next? Will you add mobility to line of sight or a defensive to allow you to stay in? All these thoughts should cross your mind before using your interrupt, as by delaying it, you can afford precious seconds to wait for your other utility spells. Remember, not all spells are equal. Some spells like Void Torrent and Ray of Frost have cooldowns that start when they're cast and can swing the game in favor of the enemy if left unchecked. Tracking these abilities will allow you to prepare and hold on to your interrupts for these moments. Rather than kicking rotationally, think about what the enemy wants to do in the future. Next up, we're going to begin with the most frustrating mistake that is causing a ridiculous amount of losses per day, and the largest amount of Rage Whispers. Just ask any major hunter. Nothing is worse than getting trained all game, finally landing CC, and then having it instantly break to their partner's damage. Or just imagine yourself, cooldowns ready, you are about to stun the kill target, and for no reason at all, your partner resets DRs. Breaking CC and not paying attention to DRs are two of the biggest game-losing mistakes being made every second in Arena. Think of WoW like a turn-based game, where each set of diminishing returns is your big move. The better you make that move, the stronger your position. Now, if you throw out your crowd control and the enemy team doesn't use a single defensive, you're in a tough spot. You basically hand them the keys to steamroll you for the next 21 seconds until your diminishing returns are back up. Maybe you've heard CC doesn't matter, but here's a quick quiz to prove that wrong. What's more effective, doing half a million damage into a target while their healer is free, or doing half a million damage into a target who is stunned while their healer is CC'd? It's a no-brainer. Sure, damage is important, but by breaking the crowd controls of your team or resetting DRs, you're putting yourself behind. The fix couldn't be more simple. Just pay more attention to Gladius and big debuffs. If you are about to use your stun, check for DRs first. It's totally fine to hold onto your offensive CDs if you can get a stronger kill window with a full duration stun. Both of these add-ons also make it much more obvious when a target is CC'd. When you're playing with a rogue, mage, hunter, or other classes with breakable CC and routine setups, it's worth it to pay more attention to your add-ons. After all, playing with these classes generally means you will only kill during CC, so there's no reason to give up your win condition when avoiding this blunder only takes a few milliseconds of checking add-ons. Now let's talk dots. If you're a dot class, you'll know the pain of ramping up all your damage and having it ripped away from you for that really high value blinding light. In this clip, you can see how far behind this puts Venruki's team, dying incredibly early with zero counter pressure. He's an affliction warlock and has less AoE pressure than the single target ret hunter. 
Let's be real here, WoW mechanics weren't exactly built with PvP in mind, and that shows when it comes to DOTs. They're not meant to be dispelled left and right. There's a reason they keep ramping up that unstable affliction backlash damage. Through removing your partner's DOTs, you're essentially disarming your teammate for 10 seconds as they painfully try to get their damage rolling again, allowing the other team to get tempo on you and angering your buddy in the process. Think of it this way, if the enemy healer is spam dispelling or bopping off bleeds, why are you doing his job for him through scattering that DPS for 3 seconds? If you really are insistent on crowd controlling when playing with a DOT class, talk about your win condition with them in the starting room. Often at times you can create a winning plan through focusing all your crowd control on the healer while allowing your partner to only DOT two targets, but you must convey this to them or run the risk of a very frustrated partner. Now let's cover a common defensive mistake in Shuffle, greeting cooldowns in the early game. How many games have you been in where the enemy team rambles in, guns blazing, you try desperately to kite it out, these guys don't deserve my wall, you think to yourself. However, the pressure is just too much to handle. You end up using your defensive right on the brink of death, and guess what, your healer does the same. It's a panic move and it usually leads to getting completely steamrolled. This situation arises because of something we call negative tempo. In the fast paced world of arena and particularly in shuffle, matches can quickly snowball. If you find yourself on the defensive, you're likely to fall significantly behind, often leading to swift losses. However, if you proactively trade your damage reduction defenses early in the game, it enables you to match your opponent's tempo during their burst phase, minimizing their offensive push with one of your own. Now, saying this, you should avoid committing your immunities early unless absolutely needed. This means bubble, ice block, burrow, and aspect of the turtle. Yes, hunters, we're aware it's not technically an immunity, but you should get the point. Even though these are your most powerful defensives, they don't allow you to play the game. Instead, they put you in a defensive stasis where you're still behind for the entirety of their duration, meaning you then have to completely flip the switch on the enemy team afterward to claw back control of the match. So next time you're in a game and the enemy team tries to swifty you to an early grave, trade that wall as soon as you can use it to counter pressure and avoid negative tempo. Moving on, it's time we talk about a critical aspect of arena gameplay that is often overlooked. You need to start taking down more NPCs, and we're not talking about those botting elementals. Countless wins are prevented every day due to players not removing the biggest healing of any shaman's toolkit, their healing stream and healing tide. Totems are a huge part of any shaman's toolkit, and similar to damage over time effects, they aren't really built in with the thought in mind that they can just die. No matter if you're facing an elemental, enhancement, or restoration shaman, by killing totems you are causing the enemy a massive headache and reducing their healing drastically. Think of it like purging an entire row of resto druid hots with only one or two globals. You wouldn't pass that up, right? This doesn't just apply to totems though, as there are plenty of other guardians in the game that are preventing you from winning the game through being allowed far too much uptime. First up is the fell obelisk from Demonology Warlocks, which is literally giving themselves and their legion of pets bloodlust. By targeting this and killing it with one global, you have negated one of their biggest offensive cooldowns. Similarly, Demonic Tyrant, their other biggest offensive, can easily be shut down with any crowd control, interrupt, or can even be killed. When facing a Demonology Warlock, always look to have a plan of action for this huge cooldown. Every Warlock can also play Observer, which has the potential to actually be one of their top damage spells against casters unless it's killed. The best players recognize this and instantly snipe it down, removing an entire cooldown with one attack. Next, we have War Banner from Arms Warriors, which is literally preventing your team's setups by just being on the map. Reducing crowd control by 50% and lasting a ridiculously long time if left alone, the value this spell can get is probably the highest potential in the game if unchecked. Make sure you one-shot this on sight. And finally, who hasn't died to their teammates not killing that Shadow Priest Psy Fiends while you get stunlocked? Being the guy to sweep the map is crucial in Shuffle, as often no one else will really bother, so you need to start being the carry you want to see in the world. Next, let's talk about Dampening, one of the most common win conditions in Solo Shuffle. Due to Dampening's healing reduction effect beginning at 20% and racking up so quickly, it will end up being the deciding factor in many of your games if you know how to use it like the pros. When Dampening kicks in, suddenly 2 and 3 minute offensive cooldowns like True Shot, Icy Veins, and Incarnation all become win conditions on their own merits, thus making a plan of action with these kill windows is vital. When people say CC doesn't matter, what they truly mean is that during most dampening, damage matters the most, and with these cooldowns up, you can win the game with damage alone, but CC obviously helps. Before ripping your cooldowns for the second time, remember that it is probably your last chance you get to use them in that round, so delaying for the perfect moment is often the wiser choice. Whether it involves securing crowd control on the enemy healer or waiting for even higher dampening, this patience can guarantee your cooldowns finish the game. Next, let's talk about healers. 
Each healer has their pros and cons, and if you're not playing according to your healer's strengths, you're going to lose game after game. Too many matches are thrown in shuffle based on players trying to bring games to dampening with low throughput healers like Discipline Priest, or playing far too rushed down with a very passive healer like Casted Mistweaver. If you want to truly succeed in Arena, adapting your game plan to your healer's playstyle is vital. So, how do we do this, you may wonder? Well, healers are grouped into two categories, offensive and defensive. The offensive healers include shamans, priests, evokers, or fist weavers. These all have a great kit for winning the game, combining powerful crowd controls and damage with a trade-off of being weaker and dampening as their throughput isn't as high as the defensive healers. If you're playing with one of these aggressive healers, then flat out hyper aggro is the way to win. You can play aggressive through crowd controlling the enemy healer on cooldown, trading your defenses very fast, and trying to do as much damage as possible will work out with these healers as they require high tempo to be effective. In turn, they will assist you in the win through damage of their own and crowd control, but only if you give them room to breathe. On the flip side, if you're playing with a defensive healer like a Paladin, Druid, or a Casted Mistweaver, you can always bring the game to dampening due to their high throughput. When you play with one of these defensive healers and face an offensive healer, always remember that if you try to take as little damage as possible, minimize risks with your positioning, and overall play a very safe game, you can win through the age-old mantra of doing damage and not dying. That's not to say you cannot play offensive with a defensive healer, but it is incredibly important to be mindful of this built-in win condition. The second error people make with healers is not knowing where your healer is standing. This is crucial, as by knowing where your own healer is, you can allow them to have their ideal positioning, be it line of sighting crowd control on a pillar, or being enabled to push in for that game-winning fear. By not overextending, you allow your healer to have an easy time healing you, as otherwise they become vulnerable in the middle of the map, or you might even lose the game as you chase down that target behind a wall. Although overextending is a huge issue, standing on top of your healer is also one of the worst things you can do. When you stand on your healer, you not only allow them to be cleaved by the enemy team, but you also open them up to be crowd controlled easier and even pummeled by melee. Standing on your healer also means that when they do get crowd controlled, the enemy doesn't have to move to get to you, allowing them to have full uptime with no room for you to kite. The only time you want to stand on your healer is if they are already CC'd and you want to try to break it with the enemy's splash damage. You're trying to eat a trap or you are all grouped up trying to recover from a spell cleave. Moving on, do you ever find it impossible to land crowd control on the enemy healer as a caster? Or maybe you're playing melee but somehow the fight always lands on top of your own support player while the enemy's healer is free casting in the back. A huge error players constantly make is pushing on top of the enemy healer to crowd control them, resulting in them taking huge damage while the enemy healer dances around the pillar, reducing all your plans to ashes. This can all be fixed with better positioning. Instead of chasing the healer down, force them to come to you. By crossing the map away from the healer, you force them to give up their pillar as they follow their DPS players. This then allows you to punish them in the middle through crowd control or even a potential swap. Alternatively, you can push on top of them if you have the mobility for it, but always make sure you have an engaging crowd control to do this with. Whether it's Intimidation for Trap, Coil for Fear, Bash for Cyclone, Dragon's Breath for Sheep, or Psychic Horror for Fear, the instant engaging CC is vital to your push. You don't want to push in for CC if it's not guaranteed. When it comes to a melee's point of view, the absolute worst thing you can do is drag the fight on top of your own healer, making them vulnerable to kicks, CCs, and swaps. Instead, you want to be constantly pushing towards the enemy healer, dragging the fight as close to them as possible. This allows you to be the aggressor and frees up your healer to spam cast in the back while their support player is struggling against your whole kit. Our final mistake lies in prioritizing our current rating over improving our gameplay. It's a common trap that many of us fall into. Picture this, you've just returned home after a long day at work, eagerly anticipating your next shuffle session. You log in eager to reach that aspired rating goal you set for yourself be it pushing for that transmog or just the satisfaction of being among the best. You wait in the queue for what feels like an eternity, and finally, it pops. You dive into the game, give it your all, but end up losing rating. Frustration sets in, and you find yourself muttering, my healers suck, I can't do more than this. You queue up for another game. The cycle repeats, and before you know it, hours have passed, your rating has plummeted, and you crawl into bed, your day is ruined. If this sounds familiar, ask yourself, why are you so fixated on that end goal, especially when there's room for improvement in your gameplay? Think about it. In any other aspect of life, would you take a crucial final exam without preparing for it first? Probably not. When your sole focus is on gaining rating, you set yourself up for failure. You become nervous, fearful of losing your precious points, and worst of all, you get frustrated when things don't go your way. However, when you approach each match as an opportunity to improve, your mindset changes. You become calmer and more composed, and your gameplay improves significantly. 
Just listen to the Bob Ross of bodybuilding. Guy who likes walking is gonna walk further than the guy who likes the destination. You understand? To enhance your gameplay, focus on specific aspects of your class, whether it's increasing your damage output, optimizing your utility, or using your defensive abilities more effectively. This focused approach will make you increasingly aware of these factors in each game and help you improve rapidly. You need to remember that gaining rating in one session or season is only temporary, but improving your gameplay will allow you to climb in the future and become a truly great player. This is why we focus on teaching the fundamentals for every class at SkillCap.com. It's because we know that true improvement is built with a solid foundation, which is what we offer with every class course. We even have Master in Minutes guides that teach you advanced concepts in easy to follow videos. And if that wasn't enough, you can even get personalized help from expert players using our Discord Ask a Pro feature. All of this and more is why we guarantee improvement. As long as you use our website, we promise you will get better faster than you thought possible. So what are you waiting for? Visit the links below for an exclusive discount offer. All right, guys, that wraps it up for this one. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and tell us your plans for season three. For now, we want to thank you all for watching. See you soon.